everyone, and welcome to Ishi's South Asia Union Summit led by women. My name is Ekta Kapoor, and I'm the founder of Ishi. The summit brings together 50 women from 13 countries to speak on issues of gender equality, social justice, and peace in South Asia. It started yesterday on October 2nd to mark Gandhi Jayanti and UN's International Day of Nonviolence. We had some brilliant conversations yesterday in seven sessions, and together, you know, we managed to uncover the entrenched nature of patriarchy that has not only oppressed women down the centuries, but also damaged the minds of men, created cycles of violence, traditions, and systems that perpetuate inequality. Yesterday, we had looked at these patterns through the lens of society, history, and economics. Today's six sessions will turn the gender lens on media, technology, education, religion, and politics. First up today is a discussion on the role of women in peace building by two well-known scholars. I welcome Dr. Minakshi Gopinath and Dr. Radha Kumar. Thank you both for being here. I'm honored to do your introductions. Dr. Minakshi Gopinath has been a mentor to thousands of Indian women and peace builders, first as an educationist and now in her role as founder and director of WISCOM which was launched in 1999 to promote the leadership of South Asian women in the areas of international politics, peace, security, and diplomacy. WISCOMP is an initiative of the Foundation for Universal Responsibility of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Dr. Gopinath has piloted regular conflict transformation workshops and collaborative projects among the intellectuals of the Sark region and especially between young Pakistanis and Indians. She's a member of multi-track peace initiatives, such as the longest sustaining track two Nimrana initiative between India and Pakistan, and the Pakistan-India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy. She was the first woman to serve on the National Security Advisory Board of India, and serves on the governing boards of many research institutes, think tanks, NGOs, and educational institutes. She's a recipient of various awards, including the Padma Shri. And on a personal note, I have to thank her for being the force behind this summit as well. WISCOMP is the partner for the South Asia Union Summit led by women. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Gopinath for empowering me, not just with the resources, but also with her connections, her words of wisdom, and her blessings for the summit. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ekta. Thank you. It's a privilege. It's truly a privilege to be here. And you are the one who's led the way, not I. <laughs> You've supported all the way. <laughs> And I'm also happy to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Radha Kumar, former Director General of the Delhi Policy Group. Dr. Kumar was a member of the Council on Security and Cooperation in the Asia Pacific. Sorry, I'll have to just mute over there. A specialist in ethnic conflicts and peace building, Dr. Kumar has authored six books and dozens of policy reports, journal articles, book chapters, and newspaper columns. She was a member of the group of interlocutors for Jammu and Kashmir appointed by the government of India and is on the boards of the United Nations University Council and the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. Dr. Kumar has also been director of the Mandela Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at Jamia Millia Islamia University and a senior fellow in peace and conflict studies at the Council on Foreign, Foreign Relations in New York. She served as executive director of the Helsinki Citizens Assembly in Prague and Associate Fellow at the Institute for War and Peace Studies at Columbia University. She's currently joining us from Kodaikanal in Tamil Nadu. So welcome, Dr. Kumar. I'm so happy to have you here as well. And now I will leave it to the both of you to share your views on the role of women in peace building and conflict resolution. And I will join you back in a bit. Fabulous initiative. And WISCOMP is truly privileged uh, to partner with you uh, and your work in engendering the discourse on regional cooperation and reinforcing and rebuilding bridges. So once again, thank you. Um, I want us to begin today uh, by acknowledging or celebrating the life of an iconic woman who invested her energy, activity, in all of by decade for solidarities in the South Asian region. Kamla Bhasin, she will introduce 
provide space for these to blossom unfettered and to find ever greater resonance in our region. And she did this with her unusual feminist weapons, as Urveshi Butalia said, with laughter, with song, with slogans and art. And along with all creative methods, she lived the motto that a woman's place is in the resistance. She touched many, many lives in deep, profound ways. We lost her to cancer on the 25th of September, but the manner of her leaving reflected her indomitable spirit and her sheer zest. Her funeral, in a sense, was a unique and unu as was as unique and unusual as her life. She got a rousing send-off with songs that she had written for the movements, uh, her comrades in arm, her coast travelers sang a tribute to her work to recover her lifelong commitment to recognize the abiding strength and value of friendships, usually feminine friendships that transcended borders and boundaries. No South Asian feminist event was complete without her presence, not in the past, not today. So today we do invoke her spirit, call her into this circle, which I'm privileged to share with someone as well known and eminent as Radha Kumar, and also to celebrate Kamla's life in gratitude. Many of you know her, many were privileged to have her as a friend. So welcome Kamla to stay with us at this summit. Wiscomp had given her the Shiro of Courage Award and even there, her acceptance speech was peppered with her usual characteristic slogan, Ham kya chahata hai, azadi, and bandhano se azadi. So breaking free of the shackles that hold us back, shackles of the mind, shackles of thought, and of course, oppressive patriarchal institutions. You know, Kamla had once said, uh, sarhat pe khari diwar nahi hu. Us divar pe padi darar zarur hu. So it is with that in mind today that, and it's also in the context of the celebration of the life of Gandhi and nonviolence that we commence. Uh, and it is necessary for society not to atrophy, so conflict is necessary. But waging conflict nonviolently is what we women in the South Asian region have learned to do and have learned to do differently. So it is truly a pleasure today to be in conversation with another iconic woman of the region, Radha Kumar. As you have heard, Radha has traversed many worlds, many domains as educator, scholar, feminist activist, policy advisor to the government, interlocutor with wide international engagements, both with the UN and outside. She wears or has worn many scarves and many hats, uh, many scarves. And I recognize that all these words are deeply intertwined. But today I want to draw on her insights as Radha Kumar, the feminist peace builder, for her insights on the role of women in peace building, especially in the context of South Asia. Radha, this particular session was deliberately titled Doing Gender, Doing Peace, because it captures in so many ways your own trajectory. Your book, The History of Doing, in 1993, missed a contribution to expanding the vocabulary of feminist engagement to capture the many women's movements that were extant in the South Asian region capturing their diversity in a non-didactic, access, accessible sort of way, and their struggle for justice, especially in 1990. And what an amazing span that was. So in many ways, the history of doing covered a range of concerns that today would be described in the language of international real, uh, real politics as non-traditional security issues. But they were human security issues, issues of livelihood, wages, domestic violence, inheritance, environment, and so on. And the family as an institution, often of oppression uh, to, of women. 
and but you had said there and i think you hold to that view even today that the feminism of and read south asia was among the most sophisticated in the world especially when you compared to the rather solipsistic direction that western feminism was moving in at that particular time and so today if you were to bring out a new edition of uh, of uh, the history of doing and reflect the engagement of women in peace and security which at that particular point of time was not one of the formal areas in which women's role was cognized and also taking into consideration that our notion of the peace woman has changed substantially it's no longer the woman in white uh, who is passively holy and wholly passive uh, not giving anyone any kind of trouble but the woman who rocks the ship of the state who questions uh, injustice who is out there as kamla was in the resistance uh, and we also know from our own experience of south asia uh, that women were particularly active in the insurgencies especially in nepal in the maoist movement and of course the ftt cards so why do you think Anna, that it's important for women to be involved in discussions and policies about conflict peace and security and also your views rather I think uh, Dr. Kumar is having some connectivity issues. Uh, Dr. Gopinath, uh, she's she's trying to connect, but we we can't see her. Okay, can she hear us? Maybe we could even hear. Her. Yeah, do Dr. Kumar, can you? Uh... No, I don't think I can hear uh, anything. She told me that when it, when it rains in Kodaikanal. Oh yeah, she, she mentioned that. So we we could yeah. give her a few minutes, but a few seconds yes, maybe can, she will come in. Yes, 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 yes. She she's there now. I think yes. the camera is on at least. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Oh. So rather, I was I was just walking through the trajectory of the history of doing, and and I was I said how we had deliberately called this session doing gender and doing peace because we were thinking of you primarily as someone who embodied this particular engagement and my question to you and and of course i was also mentioning how seminal that work was and how it expanded the canvas of our understanding on the women's movements in india and you had described the women's movements in india and south asia as among the most sophisticated in the world and you had also said at that point that western feminism was tending to get a little too solipsistic so my question to you as someone who's traversed so many paths and also in the context of our own idea of the peace woman having gone through a dramatic metamorphosis you know not the florence nightingale kind of figure in white but someone who rocks the ship of the state someone who's places there in the resistance uh, with the legion of disobedient women who are questioning uh, the uh, massive constructions of war making and peace building why do you think radha from your experience and your own work it's important for women to be involved in discussions and policy making about conflict peace and security in our part of the world Well, at a very broad level, I would simply say it's an essential facet of democracy uh, uh, that people of every community and every gender uh, should be involved in in peacemaking, especially the entire range in the conflict area. Because if you don't uh, have everyone involved, you're not going to get a sustainable peace. Now, having said that, we also know. <coughs> as uh, what you have pointed to, uh, that women have uh, for centuries been in the forefront of peacemaking, uh, uh, first in a humanitarian capacity, 
um, and as activists. And then uh, I think um, increasingly as people who brought um, both a similar and a different uh, experience of conflict, uh, a, a more intimate experience in many ways, and also um, uh, uh, women are often targeted in conflict. Uh, and well, you know, we should we should think ourselves um, fortunate in that women activists did manage to get rape recognized as a war crime, uh, something which is relatively recent, only 30 years ago. Um, but, you know, when we think about the vote, you know how long it took in many countries uh, for the vote to be granted. I think even up to the 70s, there were countries still granting the vote to women. Uh, and all of this had to come through women's activism. Now that in itself, to my mind, uh, should show very clearly how important it is to have women uh, involved in peacemaking and peace building. Peace building, classically, we've had um, women in the forefront again of post-war and post-conflict reconstruction. Uh, but, but in those negotiating processes uh, that might help end a conflict, by and large, until Resolution 1325 came along, you saw very little forefronting of women um, in, in, in negotiations. The other thing that sort of strikes me about negotiations is, um, I'm sure you have noticed this perhaps even more than I have, that how when women um, get into semi-official positions, in negotiations, the tendency of women's groups is to think of them as honorary men and not as women at all. They suddenly get excluded from all the gender um, and not only the gender identities that they have, but also the gender related work they've done. And I, I've always found that enormously puzzling uh, because um, politics shows us that women have to struggle and fight to get involved, even, even uh, with so great a figure as Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, they had to fight to be included in the salt march and in the uh, freedom uh, struggle. Uh, so we do ourselves a great disservice when we regard power as a location that is so very, very alienated from us, that we wish to have nothing to do with it. Uh, it, it becomes somewhat self-defeating uh, in my experience to have that approach to it. And uh, um, maybe, maybe that approach is also one of the reasons why, um, it, you know, when you look at 1325, you see that the Scandinavian countries have made huge progress in involving women and supporting women in peace negotiations. Um, but our own country and our region, South Asia, has been a dreadful laggard uh, in comparison. I mean, Africa is so much, doing so much better than us when it comes to... Uh, uh, well, you mentioned that, uh, you know, women who hold up half the sky uh, need to be brought in also because, and uh, not just because you leave out a huge range of solutions if you leave them out, but also their own experience of marginal marginalization brings a kind of perspective that a that these manuals don't do. You know, we have so many yes. man panels that are man. So, and, and to get back to your very, very pertinent point, how do we do all this without essentializing women or using the category of women in a sort of reductivist, homogenizing kind of way without understanding the issue of intersectionality? After all, in India and of course in the South Asian region as a whole, women face a continuum of, of uh, of violence 
and everyday violence. I mean, there even during peacetime, there is a peacetime war that they have to negotiate or engage with almost on a daily basis. Uh, it's pervasive in our region. Uh, and we broadly call it patriarchy, but there are so many different strands and levels and so on. Without saying that men make war and women make peace, how do we negotiate the right to live in peace as a human right? That's one, one question. And rather, you know, I remember that in 2013, you had as a director of the Delhi Policy Group, you were probably one of the first people in this region who had convened a partnership for peace dialogue and is essayed a superb South Asia peace charter. I have a copy of it with me. I'm sure you may not, but I have it. <laughs> and I'm happy to send it to you. It was, a, it was an exceptional document because a whole host of issues were invoked there. Um, it had conflict prevention and resolution, specifically referring to UNSCR 1325. Uh, it had foregrounded the role of women against discriminatory laws, hate speech, which is so relevant today, uh, promoting diplomacy and regional mediation initiatives. And you highlighted justice and reconciliation and restorative rather than retributive justice. But the, and you've spoken also about civilian protection, which very few people speak about uh, today in the context in which you spoke about. Uh, peace education, and the role of media, I think in Article 8. And many of the issues that are being covered by the Ishi Summit could well have been taken from your charter, uh, but they were forward linked. Yet they were deeply uh, dependent or embedded within the SARC uh, expectation. Right, because it was a present, it was to be presented to the SARC to wake up SARC and say, hey, please do something. Subsequent to that in 2014, and I think drawing from the inspiration and the kind of energy that your charter had set, uh, so network when the initiatives to frame a South Asian which is something we all, all talk about, but time, peace, and development together very, very strongly. And we met in the living of equitable development. And of course, I think huge amounts of money in our region are being spent on arms. And you know, as Rita Manchanda had said, we have a national. Uh, security pathology. And when we have this, along with the ethno-nationalist competition that we have in our region, how do you see the deficiencies of SARC have created a situation where it is now become very necessary for a counter-narrative of a kind that goes beyond just the shared culture, the common histories, and the porous borders and the overlapping ethnic identities to this basic issue of anxieties of the modern nation state. You know, the cartographic anxieties post the several partitions that we have that we have witnessed in this region, especially how do we build common ground you know, while recognizing difference, but building on commonalities. Rather, you know this better than any of us that when when initially people started looking at peace building between India and Pakistan, the rhetoric was, oh, they are just like us. Very soon we discovered that that was a no-no, that Pakistan was an independent country with its own independent uh, sense of self-esteem and didn't want to be like us. But that we were together in the region, we shared uh, commonality. So how would you respond to that? And my last question, a whole bunch of them here. While I have you, I want to get answers for everything under the sun. How do you build and sustain constituencies of peace in the South Asian region with women in the lead? I believe it can happen really only with women in the lead. Not leaving out men, of course, but yours. Yeah. Well, you've made so many 
uh, enormously important points. I don't quite know where to begin, but let me begin with what you just said um, about building constituencies of peace. I think, uh, uh, well, as you and I both know, uh, what's really interesting is that in conflict situations, uh, civil society networks are often amongst the first to be targeted. And they tend often to get polarized along the lines of the conflict, uh, especially when it's an ethnic conflict. Um, what I did notice, for example, in the Balkans area, was that when all the um, general civil society movements got polarized during the war in Bosnia, uh, the one network that did remain intact was the women's groups network. They kept meeting, they kept talking. Uh, they, of course, were not in, involved uh, in the negotiations. Their ideas and solutions were not taken on board in the official uh, talks to end the war. Uh, but, they, but they did show this point very clearly, that there seemed to be some potential, some strength in women's groups' networks uh, that was lacking, perhaps, in others. Here, however, uh, one of the things I have noticed over the past, say, uh, 20, 25 years is, is that, <clears throat> uh, especially in relation to India, Pakistan and India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, women's networks have come together at various points, uh, which you have also mentioned, uh, you know, the big conference in, in uh, Jamia Millia, um, headed by uh, Bina Sikri to bring together uh, women's groups from all across South Asia. Uh, uh, and our, our strand in that was the peace and peace building strand, uh, which then produced the charter that you referred to. Uh, that, however, that, that, that um, uh, uh, coordinating um, attempt did not then take off further. And if you look at it now, if we think about it now, that that there we were in the 2010s, um, clearly talking about what we could do to help uh, uh, peace processes uh, in Afghanistan, uh, we're, we're in a way in a situation today where perhaps that kind of voice would be required more than ever after the withdrawal of uh, uh, the, uh, the US and NATO troops and the walk-in of the Taliban. And yet we hear more uh, from European and American networks than we do from South Asian networks. And that's really sad because, again, as you pointed out, um, this region had amongst the strongest, most developed, most sophisticated uh, women's movements um, in the world right through from the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, and so on. And, and in a way, they were uh, another incarnation of movements that began in the 1920s. <coughs> so <coughs> it is to me very puzzling uh, uh, what has happened over here. Why is it that I have, well, maybe I'm old now, perhaps I would not have received a petition calling for you know, protection of women's rights in Afghanistan, uh, especially given that there's so much international uh, interest in that. Um, South Asian women could be using that opportunity. And I, I, maybe there are petitions, maybe there are meetings that I just don't know about. Thank you, Radha. I think um, you had, you know, Provocatively, in an article, talked about the fact, I think it was on the Panjshir, just before Panjshir fell to the Taliban. You had said that, you know, after all, the Taliban did not gain a military victory in Afghanistan. They are in Afghanistan, I quote, because the US, the NATO, and the Ghani government left. And we've surrendered the conflict, and surrendering the conflict should not mean that we surrender the peace. And, and I think it's very, very telling. I'd, I'd like you to say what, uh, to elaborate on, weigh in on what you mean there. And I do want to share with you that uh, in our region, WAF, the Women's Action Forum in Pakistan, 
the WRN, the, you know, the Women's Regional Network and the Afghan Women's Network have actually pulled their weight and sort of written these petitions. I know that Rita, Man Rita Manchanda is particularly involved in this, saying that it is time that South Asian women got involved in at, at least looking at the possibilities of what kind of intervention or shall I say solidarities that we can build which will sustain uh, if I remember correctly there was a signature campaign but the time is not to just stop with that yet what are our options how do we look at this whole humanitarian uh, uh, aid uh, you know sort of how do we look at it so that it's gen engendered in some ways and you were right mm -hmm. you know this historic moment in the 2000 four or five period when we thought that peace with Pakistan between Pakistan and India would would as Mani Shankar Ayer said uninterrupted and uninterruptible you remember those famous words yes. it was at the yes. first half of uh, Musharraf's regime and it seemed everything was so rosy beautiful there were cricket matches there were visas by the day and so on and so forth but that moment has passed has been a terrible rupture is it because democracy in some sense a bit on the retreat because of populist governments the region over and the first casualties have been uh, the women's uh, movements especially the women's movements against militarism militarization and and sort of a kind of macho uh, nationalism so would you would you like to weigh in on that here thank you yeah. Well, I, you know, you put your finger on it. We have seen the rise of uh, increasingly populist right-wing uh, governments across our region. Uh, I would put it even more strongly than you have. Uh, there has been a concerted attack on civil liberties in our country. Um, I hear the same from friends in Pakistan, um, where there have been cyclical attacks on, on certainly media freedoms almost every 15 years. Um, you see what you hear from friends in Sri Lanka. Uh, um, you know, it's one of the ironies of all time that, they, uh, that the government won a military in, uh, victory that allowed them to reintegrate the country. And yet that was accompanied where reintegration should have opened uh, uh, opportunities for a peace dividend and for further liberalizing and de democratizing the country. It had the opposite um, effect altogether. It uh, gave rein to uh, a, a form of militant nationalism, not as militant perhaps as the nationalism we have in our country or we see in Pakistan uh, or for that matter in Bangladesh. But all of these together, in an international environment uh, where, too, it seemed that chauvinist, even xenophobic uh, forces were gaining ground, uh, has certainly been a huge setback for all independent institutions, not to mention activism and civil society networking and so on. Uh, you know, you, you raise the question of humanitarian aid. Uh, for uh, Afghanistan and what perhaps women's action networks can do. And thank you very much for telling me that there have been great initiatives and they're ongoing. Um, I would say there are two or three things uh, that we need to think about. I mean, first of all, we don't even know the argument has pledged anything for humanitarian aid in Afghanistan. And uh, if they have, how much have they pledged? Uh, secondly, despite so many disparate voices saying, for goodness sake, uh, rescue people, give visas, facilitate their coming to India if they wish to do, our government is not doing it. They are entirely impervious. Uh, now, I would have thought that... Uh, perhaps a petition or a signature campaign or whatever, just say, making this point and signed by women's groups from all over South Asia to our respective governments saying, open your doors. 
um, uh, uh, would at least gain attention. That part always of activism, which is that you need the support that attention will give you, whether it's media attention or diplomatic attention or, you know, international women's groups attention, whichever way it is, you do have to work. That has to be one of the goals. Um, the other thing on engendering. This is, of course, one of the biggest, most difficult issues that, as far as I understand it, every humanitarian aid group working in Afghanistan has to deal with. That, you know, in uh, it, it may be easier to get humanitarian aid to families. And this is where, of course, women come in. Who is allowed to enter the house? More likely women aid workers than male aid workers. Who is allowed to uh, um, be able to uh, enumerate your children? Again, women aid workers uh, will have a much greater chance of success than will male aid workers. Uh, and that's something that every humanitarian aid organization has pointed to is the need for women aid workers to be given access, to be given protection. Um, by the uh, current Taliban regime. Uh, simple things like that. Further, of course, come other questions. What are you going to prioritize? What about girls' schools? You know, boys are going back, girls are not. Should you be putting pressure with age for that? Uh, there's a series of questions like that that need to be addressed. I think I even read that actually um, uh, uh, gynecologists are facing even more severe um, problems of provision of medicines and equipment and so on than our uh, doctors in other fields. So, and I'd okay. like to Sorry, go ahead. By that, Meenakshi, if I might, to one of the points. Uh, to one of the points you had earlier made, uh, which is uh, how do we avoid essentialism? It seems to me that uh, the big problem for us uh, in our country and in South Asia is that we have not yet managed to achieve a political consciousness or awareness um, across society that women are disadvantaged and therefore uh, you have to try to level the playing field for them in, uh, in any of their chosen professions. Well, if you're a scientist or if you're a doctor, you have to just be much better than your male counterpart in order to get the same job. That has to change. That has to change, that, that consciousness that does not recognize that at least let there be equal footing. And of course, for that, you're going to need affirmative action. Until you do that, you will not be able to get the kind of participation that is required for democracy, uh, which is, uh, let's look at men. Does anyone ever ask that question of why should men be, uh, you know, considered uh, as having gender rights? Nobody asks that because they already have, not only have them, those are the dominant rights. Uh, but when you look at male participation, you'll get a bureaucrat, you'll get an army guy, you'll get uh, maybe a medic. How come when you look at women's participation, you don't think just automatically, yes, I want a security expert, I want a, 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 an interfaith uh, expert, I want a, a humanitarian aid expert. So thank you, you Raja. We spoke about the manners and we know how that works in our region. But I have I have a message from Ekta that we have very little time, but I can't let you go without asking you this one question. You know, you were one of the few women who were very close to the track one process of being close to the negotiation table. And you were equally involved with people's movements. We normally have, uh, you know, high table diplomats of late. We've had a wonderful Secretary Nirupama Rao, who, who spoke about a, a so-called feminist foreign policy. That's a different uh, debate we can have. And, and then you have a lot of women at the grassroots with, uh, with NGOs, 
with civil society organizations, not someone who's traversed that range in between. Now, two questions quickly. You spoke about identity issues. You know, disputes can be settled because they're about interests, but conflicts have to be resolved because they're about identity. And you were one of the first scholars on Kashmir who talked about Kashmir not as in, through the lens of territoriality, but through the lens of history, culture, shared borders, and so on and so forth. And we, in our own work in Atwas in Kashmir, found that Kashmir was so completely that people in Kashmir did not have a sense of their own history. How important, given the fact that history is so implicated in all kinds of ideological issues, and not entirely an emancipatory um, sort of say, route to understanding. That's one. Second, as interlocutor, you were one among three uh, interlocutors on Kashmir. The government sent you there. I believe you spoke in a different voice, as Kate, uh, Car uh, Carol Gilligan would say. But how different was your voice? My sense is most of them were thinking about settling the dispute and ending the conflict. And you were looking at issues of justice and issued issues of positive peace. So how what was the difference in the woman's voice as an interlocutor occupying the track one and a half space? Well, uh, I hope this is only an individual reflection and not a reflection on the women's movement or women's voices. But, uh, as many people told me, including my colleagues, it was very naive of me to imagine uh, that this uh, position would allow me to do something for peace or justice or human rights in, uh, the, the, in the positive sense. Uh, nevertheless, naive as I was, I did have that expectation. And, uh, well, you know, I, I always find this something that is both amusing and terribly irritating, is that my colleague said to me, you know, we divided portfolios. One of them uh, um, looked at economic issues. Uh, another looked at political parties, political issues, and so on and so forth. And they said to me, uh, well, you know, apart from doing all the networking work and uh, uh, helping frame the way that we approach our work and what we look at, you." you do human rights. And so I looked at them and I said, well, you know, you do realize that's the most difficult uh, uh, issue. And uh, they said, yes, but you see, you're a woman, so <laughs> you'll be better on human rights. And I know what an utterly ridiculous statement to make. You care for human rights, you care for human rights. You don't, you don't. Being a woman does not make me. Uh, um, uh, you know, more prone to, uh, uh, to, to care for human rights. In fact, uh, as, as you and I both know, we have some women ministers who clearly care nothing for human rights at all. Um, <clears throat> but the issue there was very simple. It was the most difficult, especially at this point in time where you would had uh, you know, this uh, um, uprising of stone pelting. And so many people were in jail, by, uh, thousands of young people. Uh, and it was clear that this would be a, the most intractable, most difficult uh, uh, thing to get some sense of, forget justice, at least some sense of uh, flexibility instead of rigid, uh, ideological approaches. The, um, the other thing that I felt about this, and this may apply more to uh, your area and mine of peacemaking and peace building, is that there's no doubt at all that having had that civil society experience makes you far more uh, so imaginative in the approaches that you can have because you've had a far more wide-ranging conversation uh, in which people have been far franker than they will be at a more official or even a semi-official level. And so you can bring that knowledge and awareness to actually crafting a peace process that looks towards, uh, if not um, a final resolution immediately, 
that you have to put in place the building blocks that will lead you to progress. Now, our history, alas, has been one of making enormously rapid progress. When you look at uh, the Vajpayee to Manmohan peace process, in five years, look at the progress from war to a situation of casualties below a couple of hundred, to talks, to negotiations, to having every shade of political opinion involved. Huge, right? Not the first time, by the way, there have been such attempts right from the 50s onwards, each of them making huge progress and then just as rapidly returning to ground zero. And this is the most puzzling thing for me, is how is it that you always return to zero? Why is it not that you can go from zero to one and then the next phase can be one to two, at least, you know, we're not talking 10. But how is it? We, we now we have always... the, the orange light on and, and I think you're, what you're saying is very valid. We have to really think if we have moved to zero or have we moved to minus one? That's a big question too today. But yes. as you rightly said, Radha, you've decided as a peace builder and many others following you that it's better to sweat in war than to, sorry, better to sweat in peace than to bleed in war. And and, I, and to remember Kamla again and our dear Maya Angelou, I think that it's the business of women here now in Saudi Arabia to make peace and to not to, to, re, to recognize that we don't just want to survive, but we want to thrive. And and all that but um, you asking me to close so with a very heavy heart. I'm going to have to bid adieu to my dear friend Radha, who's decided to leave uh, the heat and dust of Delhi and retire to contemplation and writing, writing even more tracks. Her book, I'm sure you've seen on Kashmir, is path breaking like all her other work. Thank you, Radha. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I have to make my apologies for delaying our, our, the beginning of our talk with all my silly internet problems. Many apologies. And it was an honor, Eka and Minakshi, to do this, especially to, to be able to converse with you, Minakshi. Thank you. I had so many questions left, but that we have to ask Eka to convene an entire summit. Uh, yes, we'll have to have another summit for that. So thank you, Dr. Gopina. Thank you, Dr. Radha, for being here. And I, I really have taken down a lot of notes. I think there's a lot to study. Uh, there's a lot to study, a lot to think about here. And uh, some very, um, uh, not just relevant points, but also very strong points have been made today. So I think everybody needs to introspect on that. Thank you so much. Do stay around. We have a lot of interesting sessions coming up on the hour, every hour. Um, so thank you, and I'm very honored that you were here today. Thank you so much. Ekta, do take back this from a friend, a dear friend, Shivanathan, that peace is a perpetual hypothesis, and it's tested and verified every day. A people's peace cannot be an expert's peace, but it is an invitation for civil society to invent and reinvent the song of democracy. So on that democratic note, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> bye bye. Bye, Radha. Thank you. Take care. Take care. It was lovely.